Welcome to Black Story, Black Song, history through the African-American lens. But first, I'd like to make it known that this is not only Black history, this is world history. This is American history. This is your history. Our story, which has long been told as one of constant struggle and pain, a story of bondage and brutality, all of which are painfully true. But let it be known, there is also an abundance of joy and discovery and happiness and triumph of resilience, beauty, creation, and love. It is deep, it is sad and glorious and far more than will be covered here today. But in tradition of the passing down of story and song and knowledge of each one teach one, we want to dive into some lesser known stories in the world of art, literature, science, hip hop, civil rights, New Mexico history, poetry, and African ancestry. This is Black Story, Black Song, history through the African American lens. What's going on, y'all? My name is Miles Tokeno. I'm a community organizer, and I'm here to talk to you about the Civil Rights Movement. The Civil Rights Movement is so important to learn about because all the work that we do to fight social inequalities today is based on the shoulders of those who fought in the Civil Rights Movement. So what was it? It was a decades-long fight against racial discrimination, racial violence, and segregation. Throughout the 50s and 60s, black organizers and leaders and community members came together to fight to be included in this country. So in my speaking to the civil rights movement, I want to clear up a couple misconceptions. As, as an organizer, it's really important to be able to highlight these things. So when I think about how the civil rights movement is, is taught, I think about the focus on the individual. Think about Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks, and not to diminish any of the work that they did because they did and they were incredible leaders, but the work took the entire community. It took leaders and organizers, clergymen, and it took people like you and me, right? Where our family members who walked side by side, um, those leaders made the difference to change the hearts and the minds of our nation to say, we as black people deserve to be here, deserve to have the same protections and same access to the resources of this nation. The second misconception that I have is that it was just struggle and it was just a fight and it was just violence. I think in terms of social justice, we can get into that mindset where it's only about hard work. And it was, there were so many sacrifices from people getting locked up to people passing away to fight for these freedoms that we have today. But there was also so much more. It was incredible music and songs and worship and art and, and joy as well. And that is such an important part of being able to make change as well, is being able to touch the hearts and minds of, of everybody. And you can't do that with just one way. One thing that I love about the civil rights movement is this phrase that I use today in my organizing, nothing about us without us. So what does that mean? It means that those people who are making decisions about our lives, about where we go to school, what we learn about how much money we get paid, about having access to healthcare, that they can't be making those decisions without our input, without us being at the table. Nothing about us without us. And that to me speaks to the passage of the Voting Rights Act during the Civil Rights Movement that allowed our protection and safety to be able to vote. And I think that our inclusion in democracy is such a big deal and that our democracy doesn't work, right? Our society doesn't work without our inclusion and without our participation. So I ask you today to get involved um, by making sure that you're registered to vote. And if you can't vote, make sure everybody in your household is registered to vote. Um, outside of that, you can do a myriad of things as well. You can come together as a community with friends, neighbors, and be able to talk about the issues that affect you and say, we deserve better. 
And that's what the civil rights taught us, is that in the face of any inequality, we can come together as a community and fight for justice and liberation. Hi there, I'm Lucky Daniels. Um, I'm here to talk to you about African ancestry today. Um, we're going to work to accomplish five things. The who, what, why, how, and where. Uh, who, I'm Lucky Daniels. I'm a technology software manager. Um, by day, I manage technology teams that deliver medical devices that save lives. But when I'm not managing technology teams, I'm focused on my ancestry. Um, I've been a genealogist, which is a researcher of my family history for over 30 years. And it's a passion that's very important to me um, because I didn't know a lot about my family history as a descendant of slaves. In 1992, I was losing my grandmother. And as she began to talk about our family history, I found that there were a lot of questions and I needed to know more. And so I began the process of researching our history. Why is this important? For African descendant, uh, descendants of slaves, we don't have a lot of history. We didn't adopt a lot of history. We don't inherit history. And so we have to actively follow our history and research our past to learn more about our families. And so for me, it, this is a part of my story. It's a part of who I am. Um, Katie, here to my left, this is my fourth grandmother, and understanding who Katie is helps me to understand who I am. When you talk about African ancestry and talk about this work, you really want to look at where the clues are. Like, how will we go about finding this information? Um, the good news is that we now have technology to aid us, and that is going to make a huge difference in how we research today and how we'll research in the future. Um, we use tools that are online, but we also use interviews and narratives from our friends, our family, um, our elders, our grandparents, our aunts, our uncles, newspapers, journals, Bibles. We look for information everywhere. It's like the detective work of your family history. It's important that we follow the clues. It's important that we ask a lot of questions because there are going to be a lot of unknowns and for me, I've always become comfortable with the unknowns. I'm always very grateful as a descendant of slaves who did not necessarily have their history recorded. I'm excited when I find out anything about my family. I capture all of it. And then I keep going back and I go back again and again to really find out the answers to the unanswered questions. And so you're gonna to need to put on a detective's hat how? How will we go about doing it? We're going to use all the tools. We're going to start with paper. Um, there are reports that you can print out. There are charts that you can use that make it easy to capture this information. It's not enough to answer the questions. You want to be able to document your findings because you're going to be using that research to build your family's history from now on. And then we're going to turn to the technology because that's the gift. Um, there are a few resources that we can look at today. And I know you won't believe it, but you're going to find information. You're going to find relatives. You're going to find out where they lived and how they lived and how they worked. You're going to find out about your family history. And the more that you do that, the longer that you do that, uh, the more detailed that you are in doing that, the richer your, your history will become. So for me, this was the saving grace for my family because when I started researching, my family had two sentences that were a part of our history, and that's all we knew. And now we've gone back six generations. Um, we are finding out where my family descended from in West Africa. Um, I have found out and realized now that I am a mix of ethnicities and tribes that reign from West Africa that my family would have never known about. I found uncles that were freed and part of the Freedmen's Projects. I found Civil War veterans and heroes. I found superheroes. So what I do is I encourage you 
to be inquisitive about who you are, because this is a big deal. Your ancestry is not just your past. It's part of who you are. It's part of what creates your story. And I challenge you to go out and find it. So the science contributions of black people on the continents of Africa, North America, and Europe are numerous, and many of them date back thousands of years. In the country of Egypt, on the continent of Africa, we find a thriving civilization that existed over 5,000 years ago along the Nile River. The Egyptians created things like toothpaste, irrigation, makeup, and surgery tools. Now with these surgery tools, they were able to have an in-depth knowledge of all of the organs of the body, and they even performed surgery. The reason that we know so much about Egyptian culture is because of their invention called papyrus, which we know as paper, as well as black ink. Those two things, along with the hieroglyphs, give us a very good idea about what their culture and civilization was like. Now, the innovation didn't stop once Africans were taken from Africa and brought to other continents. In 1887, Alexander Miles invented the automatic elevator door. You see, before his invention, people had to manually open and close the elevator doors. And Alexander Miles' daughter almost died by falling down an elevator shaft after someone forgot to close the door. So he took it upon himself to figure out a way to keep all riders of any elevator anywhere in the world safe. In 1923, Garrett A. Morgan came up with the idea for the three light stoplight after witnessing a car accident in Cleveland, Ohio. Before Garrett's invention, there was only a red light and a green light. So he figured if he inserted a yellow light which meant to slow down, then drivers would be able to have a more controlled stop. So now we fast forward into the digital age. Does anybody know what VOIP stands for? It stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol. So if you've ever used FaceTime, WhatsApp, or Skype, you have a woman named Marion Croak, who is a software developer and vice president of engineering at Google to thank for that technology because all of those apps use the voice over internet protocol technology. And during this pandemic, her invention has proven to be very, very useful. Most recently, we have Dr. Hadia Nicole Green, who has proven the ability to cure cancer in mice using nanotechnology. So what Dr. Green does is she injects gold-plated nanoparticles into the tumor and uses a laser to activate the nanoparticles which makes the nanoparticles jump and heat up. And it is the heat from the nanoparticles that kills the tumor. The beautiful thing about this treatment is that none of the other cells around the tumor are harmed during the destruction of the cancerous tumor. So now black history doesn't stop there. The science edition doesn't stop there. Black history is being made in terms of science and other areas on a daily basis. And it may be in a couple of years 
we end up talking about one of you during the next Black History Science Edition. Thank you. Peace. I am Oriana Lee, MC, artist, and educator, and I'm speaking to you today about the history of hip hop. Interestingly enough, hip hop wasn't actually called hip hop at first. As a new culture in New York City in the early 70s, it was a way for youth, mostly teenagers, to express themselves, many as an escape from the poverty and gang violence that burdened their communities. Hip hop is a culture and art movement created by Americans of African and Hispanic descent. While not exclusively, hip hop culture at large has always been inclusive and welcoming of all people who represent the foundations of the culture, which has allowed for people worldwide to associate with the hip hop movement. Hip hop has four original elements, also known as founding pillars or foundations. Now a little about each element, DJing, originally called turntabling, which is using vinyl records and two turntables to manipulate sounds and create and play music, came to be known by DJ Cool Herc, who is credited with throwing the first party back in 1973 in the South Bronx, South South Bronx. There, he displayed the unique style of hip hop music that he introduced by highlighting breakbeats which can be described as the drum solo breakdown often heard in soul and funk music. Herc's innovative flair and fresh style on the turntables would become mad important in the growth of both the B-boy, B-girl, and the MC. MCing, also known as rapping or rhyming, is said to have accompanied the DJ since the very beginning, with party rocker Coke Rock being amongst the first. As originally the person on the microphone to make announcements and occasionally hype the crowd, catchy rhythmic rhymes and call and response, a traditional African-based vocal exchange, quickly became standard and the hip hop voice was born. Inspired and influenced by jazz scatters, soul and jazz poets, and certain local New York City radio DJs, MCN took off in popularity amongst the youth and invited those who were often voiceless to use their voice in a creative way through what is now known as rap music. DJ Hollywood, DJ and MC is widely acknowledged as the king of rap and the first person to grace the mic in true hip hop fashion. Okay, so commercially known as breakdancing or originally b-boying and b-girling with the b-short for break, the name, given by DJ Cool Herc from spinning break beats in his classic style and dancers using the music to work out their fanciest footwork to the beats. This became one of the highlights of the parties and dance style, heavily influencing first generation b-boys like Trixie and Clark Kent with mad crews to soon follow. In the early mid 80s, a number of films documented break dancing as the media coined it, bringing it worldwide recognition. B-boying and B-girl and experienced a boost in popularity in the early 90s and has continued to grow globally. Now, graffiti writing, also known as graph or writing, given mainstream attention in the 80s is a form of writing using primarily spray paint to artfully beautify public spaces and subway trains. Graffiti writing actually came before all of the other elements in the 60s in the Philadelphia underground by a writer who identified by the name Cornbread. One of the first popular New York writers was Taki183, known for his colorful wild style art, most often the hip hop style most portrayed in the media, though there are many styles. Jean-Michel Basquiat is one of the most well-known graffiti artists who was able to fully cross over into modern art as a painter. Many have been co-credited with coining the term hip hop. But according to pioneer and South Bronx community leader, Africa Bambata, Love Bug Starsky was the first to use the term as it relates to the culture. Bambata, former gang leader, did much to further popularize the term. Bambata also promoted a growing consciousness and confidence around African history and honoring it, and created the Zulu Nation, an organization to uphold the principles of hip hop, peace, love, unity, and having fun.
Allow me to note that as many of the originators were male-oriented, women have also participated in the culture since the beginning. In the early days, rappers like MC Shah Rock and Roxanne Shante were given as much respect as their male peers, as well as graffiti writers Lady Pink and Charmin 65 and B-Girl Rockefeller. They all led the way for women to be rightfully recognized as popular hip-hop artists. Since the early 70s, hip-hop has grown a lot. Today, elements of hip-hop can be found regularly used in marketing and media, television and movies, and in every crack and crevice of United States culture. Rap often gets a bad rap, regularly associated with crime, drugs, and big spending. But when you think about the real principles, a culture based on peace, love, unity, and fun has to be of great value in making this world a better place. And isn't that the kind of world we all want to live in? Hi, I'm Naima, and I'm here to talk to you all about black literature. So first, I wanted to start off by saying we have always been storytellers. Um, going back to our various tribes and nations in Africa, and that has always been a huge part of our culture and the way that we share history, the way that we talk about lessons and morals, the way that we learn. Here, as black Americans, we have confronted some barriers in being able to tell our stories and have our stories be heard. So that goes back to the sort of start of this country, right? Being brought to this country as enslaved people, it was actually illegal for black people to learn how to read and write. Being able to turn our oral narratives uh, into stories on the page was difficult, as you can imagine. But despite that, we did, right? And thinking about some of the slave narratives you might have heard about from Harriet Tubman, we use these stories not only to talk about the injustices that our people have experienced, but also to pave a road towards freedom. What that means is that we use our stories not only to give our readers pleasure, right? Reading can be fun, but also to connect to cultural and political and other artistic movements that are going on in the country. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our history in literature. I mentioned slave narratives, but we also have some really amazing writers from different eras throughout the history of our country. So first, I'd love to talk about the Harlem Renaissance. Some of you might have heard of that. It was a artistic revival, right? So slavery had ended, reconstruction had started. It was still really hard for black people to have their voices heard, appreciated, and for big publishers to include them in their um, libraries, right? And so the Harlem Renaissance, it focused on telling our stories in a way that really reflected the truth of our lived experience. So the richness, the joy, and yes, the pain, but it rejected the idea that black experience was one thing, right? Which is what it was sort of fighting against in our modern culture. We often, at that point in the turn of the century, saw really negative stereotypes of what it was like to be black. And these authors, like Langston Hughes, who wrote that the time was allowed for him to courageously and bravely tell the stories of our people without fear or shame. Zora Neale Hurston, who got to travel the country and collect some of those oral histories that I was talking about earlier. Um, we have times like the Black Arts Movement. So the Black Arts Movement was um, born out of the civil rights era of the 50s and 60s. And in the 60s and 70s, black writers and artists said, integration is really important. Being thought of as being equal is really important, but also it's very, very important for us to create spaces where if we don't have a seat at the table, we build our own table. And so those writers used literature as a way to build narratives about black people that were you know, for us and by us. And controlling the narrative and enjoying and spreading black pride and joy. Thinking about our modern black literature, where are we going? What do we have to look forward to? I think what's really beautiful about black literature is that it's ever evolving. 
So there isn't one thing that we like to write about or one story that we like to tell. One of my favorite writers uh, who writes young adult fiction, so fiction for you, I encourage you to check her out. Her name is Elizabeth Acevedo and she is a Afro-Latina Dominican writer. She was an English school teacher and she taught the eighth grade. And she asked one of her students who was having struggling a lot to get his reading assignments done. She said, why are you not interested in reading? And he said, Miss Acevedo, it's because these stories have nothing to do with us and they don't care about us, right? The characters um, were not reflective of this person's lived experience. She decided to write stories, for example, The Poet X, which is a novel, but it's written in verse. So it is a uh, sort of hybrid of poetry and prose um, about teenage black experience. And she's continued to write books about that. And they've been bestsellers and won national book awards. And so um, it's really exciting to see new black literature be celebrated and accepted. The lesson that I would love for you guys to take away in thinking about black lit is not everybody's gonna be a writer, right? We all have our different hobbies and interests, um, but that black literature allows for us to see the things that we're passionate about can lead us to advocating for um, the freedom of our people and also gives us opportunities to build worlds that we want to see, right? So it doesn't have to be about what's happening right now, but we get to imagine futures in which our lives are wildly beautiful and brilliant, right? And I encourage you all to um, focus on that, right? Your stories matter, your voices matter. And whether it's writing or reading or working on a science project or, you know, dreaming of becoming a lawyer, you have the opportunities in those communities to use the lessons of black literature to build a better future. Hi, my name is Gregory Waits and um, I'm going to be talking about the black art movement in, and uh, identity in Chicago uh, during the 60s, um, during the civil rights era, and how it sort of aligned itself with that, with that time period and why. But I think first to um, even talk about it is to, we have to look back, I think, and look at uh, the African diaspora um, as, as well as the migrations of uh, African Americans. In, in relationship to that, then we had this sort of art context, and especially the um, AACM, which uh, catapulted um, in the 60s. AACM actually means the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians. Their idea around uh, that was for them to incorporate experimentation, improvisation, and to also look at themselves from a collective point of view. And so in that they wanted to sort of discard the old hierarchies of jazz. They were primarily jazz musicians. They also um, wanted to sort of celebrate the black aesthetic in a sort of a more total theater approaching and embracing all the arts within the musical context. And this actually, and one of the reasons I'm wearing this costume is that um, much of this comes from Sun Ra, uh, who had this ability in his music to look forward, look backwards, and sort of be in the now as well. And so one of the things he brought to the music was this sort of theatrical, mythical um, future space. Uh, sort of element and so that um, one could embrace something more than music as as entertainment. Inside of that experimentation and improvisation a very uh, more elaborate language was developed that related more to um, African culture and took on a more Afrocentric sort of approach. At the same time um, right along with this, and right along with this sort of intertwining with the other art forms, you had another group that uh, had come up, which was called Afro-Cobra, 
which was the African commune of bad, relevant artist. And so again, you have this sort of very sort of militant stance and their approach to the art was that the founders were educated in sort of, sort of Eurocentric art school and they wanted to do an inversion on that. They wanted to do everything different. They saw that um, most of the African images, African-American images, were were not one that would produce self-esteem in the neighborhood. You had, you know, caricatures and just really poor ar archetypes um, that were being represented in the media. And so they wanted to uh, as part of, in, a, in alignment with this whole black uh, power movement that was going on with the civil rights movement at the time, you know, I mean, the 60s were pretty um, volatile as well in the sense that uh, we lost uh, several leaders, Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, uh, in a part, as part of that period. And so there was a, this push to um, s identify one's collective through the artwork and so they took on some principles that um, represented um, that. Uh, they used Kool-Aid colors. Uh, they also used text in their, um, in their work um, as so as to further give meaning to the work. The art has sort of expressed that. This art that sort of evolved out of it, I think expresses all of these other issues that have arrived um, inside of being an African-American um, that stemmed from this sort of identity. So identity, I think, is an ongoing and ongoing quest, uh, an ongoing condition that the arts um, have the challenge of resolving in, in individuals as well as in the collective. Hi, my name is Nikisha Breeze, and I am an interdisciplinary artist, historian, scholar, and researcher on African American history. I live in Taos, New Mexico. For the last 20 years, I've been here, but my family were some of the very first settlers here in New Mexico in the late 1800s. They came with Frank and Ella Boyer, who were uh, coming from the South, where African Americans were the victims of incredibly violent racist crimes. They came searching for freedom, looking for a place that they could live without fear for their lives, where they could raise their children and they could create an entirely new world where black people and black communities were celebrated. Blackdom, New Mexico was founded in 1903 and brought over 25 families from across the country as a part of the great black exodus of the late 1800s. The Homestead Act was enacted in 1862, which gave free blacks the possibility of being able to live on a piece of land, to work that land. You might have heard of these stories of, of being given 40 acres and a mule. Well, that promise is what pushed black families out into the West, looking for a place to call home. They came to New Mexico, and as families worked together, to build an entire community of black artists, of um, teachers, of soldiers, of people who were all looking to create a new way of life. Blackdom didn't survive very long. Unfortunately, Blackdom, through so many different problems with both drought and uh, with the local economy not supporting them enough, the town eventually was abandoned in the 1920s. This story is not the first story, though, of black people in New Mexico looking for something new. The first black person to this continent came to New Mexico. Esteban the Moor, in 1527, traveled from and through Mexico as an enslaved black African from Morocco. He was enslaved by the Spanish, came all the way into New Mexico 
to look for what they believed were cities of gold. What they found were the New Mexico Pueblos. Esteban, being a, um, a healer in his own African country, came and brought these gifts of his teachings of healing, of medicine, of plant work, into the indigenous Pueblos here in New Mexico and was welcomed with open arms. Eventually, however, as he tried to bring this energy a little deeper into New Mexico, he came to the Zuni Pueblo and they didn't want to welcome him in, knowing that he was a harbinger of a huge wave of colonization, which would decimate the rest of the country from then until now. Uh, so they did not welcome him, and unfortunately, he lost his life in that Pueblo. After that point, New Mexico became, for the Spanish, a central base for them to begin their colonization of the rest of this country. So from the 1500s all the way through into the first slave ships hit in Jamestown in 1619, black folks have been inside particularly this part of the Southwest. New Mexico history, New Mexico black history is incredibly rich. Our relationships both with the indigenous people of this land, the relationships with the Spanish coloners, both as being enslaved by the Spanish as well as leading uh, parties of colonization has been a big part of the New Mexico history. In particular, uh, one of our first settlers in New Mexico that stayed and maintained and built actually a black community here was a woman named Isabel de Olvera from 1598. She was a mulatto woman from Querétaro, Mexico, who came and settled Santa Fe, New Mexico, in this early part of, the, of our years. So New Mexico history has been and continues to be particularly black history, a very layered, very rich, and very in-depth study. Welcome to Harlem by Southwest. I'm your host, Hakeem Bellamy. Now, raise your hand if you've heard the word Renaissance before. Okay, up, up higher, I can see you. Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, not a problem. I'm gonna help you here in a second. Those of you who did may or may not have heard it right after the word Harlem, as in Harlem, New York, but the Renaissance didn't start there. It started in Florence, Italy and spread throughout Europe from the 14th to the 17th century. The period of time before the Renaissance was called the Middle Ages. Some would even say the Dark Ages. The darkness ended with the fall of the Roman Empire and then the Renaissance, which literally means rebirth in French. Many of the advances in science, art, and government that had been made by the Greeks and Romans were lost during the Middle Ages. So um, we told you it was dark, right? So the Renaissance brought in a period of enlightenment. It was a rebirth of education, of science, art, theater, literature, music, and a better life for people in general. So what's that got to do with Harlem, you say? Well, Harlem, New York is roughly 4,153 miles away from Florence. Well, a few centuries later, three to be exact, Harlem had its own renaissance, a black renaissance, and similar conditions were at play. The American economy more than doubled between 1920 and 1929. The growth of cities attracted people looking for a more comfortable way of life from the farms. This included black folk, especially black folk from the South, and you know our history with farms in the South. You could say America was coming out of its very own dark ages, also known as slavery. In the wake of Reconstruction and Jim Crow, black people moved north in droves in what was called the Great Migration. By 1970, when the Great Migration ended, over six million black people left the South for places like Chicago, Detroit, Philadelphia, shout out to my hometown, and yep, you guessed it, New York City. The Harlem section of New York City is only three square miles, and at the height of the Harlem Renaissance, nearly 175,000 African Americans lived there. It was the most dense concentration of black people in the world at the time. And these black people, well, they had money, <laughs> just like other people did. And, and this was in a time called the Roaring Twenties, and, and that money became its own awakening, remember, out of the dark. 
an awakening in fashion, writing, painting, music, and identity. The first African-American Rhodes Scholar and Harlemite, Elaine Locke, described it as a spiritual coming of age. And the artists expressing this new black became household names. Josephine Baker, Paul Robeson, Zora Neale Hurston, County Cullen, Aaron Douglas, Augusta Savage, Louis Armstrong, Count Basie, UB Black, Cab Calloway, Duke Ellington, Fats Waller, and Billie Holiday. So what's that got to do with New Mexico? Well, other than that some of those artists I just mentioned eventually made their way to a legendary Albuquerque swing club called Chet and Perts, well, Harlem wasn't just a physical place. It was a state of mind. The Harlem Renaissance wasn't just a reboot of Greco-Roman once upon a time in Italy. Long before the 14th century, Africans had communities that flourished with creative activity, just like our very own petroglyphs here. Rock paintings depicting domesticated animals provide artistic evidence of the existence of agricultural communities that developed in both the Sahara region and Southern Africa by around 7,000 BC. In short, we go way, way, way back with this art thing. And just like art doesn't have any borders confining it to one place, neither did this new black identity. New Mexico had its own piece of Harlem Renaissance in poets Anita Scott Coleman and Gene Toomer. Gene Toomer, grandson of America's first black governor, for all my folks in, in Louisiana, is famous for his 1923 masterpiece, Cain. And uh, Cain kind of looks like, if y'all like The Watchmen, I noticed that the cover of Cain kind of looks like, but anyway, Cain was one of the most important books identified with the Harlem Renaissance for its bending of language and its honest representation of black culture, both in the South and in North America. And at that time, Toomer spent time in a literary community that grew up around Mabel Dodge Lujan Taos. And in 1935, wrote a manuscript that went unpublished until 2016 titled A Drama in the Southwest. This time he gives us a glimpse into the social world of artists who sought creative and spiritual renewal in Taos, New Mexico. Taking his knack for writing about people and places to New Mexico, just like he did in Harlem, in poems like 7th Street. Money burns the pocket, pocket hurts, bootleggers in silken shirts, ballooned zooming Cadillacs whizzing, whizzing down the streetcar tracks. Anita Scott Coleman was a prolific contributor to the Harlem Renaissance and she lived in Silver City, New Mexico from 1919 until 1925. During that time, she published 13 short stories. Much of Coleman's writing focused on the Southwest, the availability of home ownership for African-Americans here, uh, her own Afro-Latino cultural heritage and knowledge of the Southwest in Mexico, which is where she was originally born, in an essay titled Arizona and New Mexico, the land of Esperanza, published in The Messenger, a popular political and literary magazine for African-Americans, in her poem, America Negra. See if you can hear the influence of New Mexico in her work. America Negra. I am Indian, I am grown old, huddled beside sand dunes, cradled in the lap of a plateau, cacti my shade, sky and land, land and sky, the sky is clear as a mirror, but the land is a painted desert. I need a Scott Coleman. So that's our time. Thank you for joining me, your host, Hakeem Bellamy, for this episode of Harlem by Southwest.